Um, welcome, um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is David Didau, in case you're wondering how to pronounce it, that is how to pronounce it. And I'm going to talk to you uh, using a very sort of clumsy, inept metaphor, uh, say about something which uh, somebody just pointed out to me uh, in a little conversation outside there that I've unwittingly stolen from uh, a book that I haven't even read um, by uh, Nicholas Taleb. And that seemed Taleb, um, called Anti Fragile. So apparently uh, it's all in there, uh, but I haven't read it, so it might be different. I don't know. Anyway, um, it seems to me, and I don't know whether you, you, uh, you've ever thought this, but it seems to me that, or it, it, had, it, it had seemed to me that the point of doing research and finding in, in, in all of this endeavour that we're sort of interested in, at least peripherally, just by turning up, uh, is about finding answers. And, and the strap line for Research Ed is finding out what works. And I want to suggest that if we view research as something which is going to produce answers, it'll never be useful. Um, I think good research is about finding better questions, about exposing ignorance and new avenues for, for exploration. And, um, and I think application of anything that is discovered is always going to be questionable and down to individual vagaries. And acknowledging that, I'd like to suggest to you, might be a good thing. So I'm going to start you off with um, uh, the first Fox reference, which is from... We all... Yeah, the first, from uh, the poem by Ted Hughes, one of my favourite poems, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, with this Ted Hughes poem, but it's about the process of creating poetry. And Ted, I'd like to imagine, is alone at night in his, in his study, uh, thinking and struggling to articulate an idea, and he has this, this vision that it's, that it's like a woodland creature, a fox which emerges from the night, um, and, and slowly as he becomes aware of it, it takes on form, it takes on shape, it becomes more and more alive and vibrant until it jumps into his head and becomes the idea on which he latches. And, and, and this sort of slow emergence uh, is something that I found was quite interesting. Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, I think this is a, a wonderful book that Jack Marwood, who's speaking at the same time, probably a much more interesting uh, talk about education data put me onto, called The Signal and the Noise. And in it, um, Nate makes this, makes this statement that, that our efforts to uncover knowledge actually expose, to, um, to expose our ignorance. The more we find out, the more we realise that we don't know. And uh, an article that I read recently by a fellow called M uh, Michael Smithson said something similar. And I really like this metaphor of, the, of knowledge being an island. And as we become aware as the shoreline of the islands, you know, as we, as we reclaim more land in the, in the vast oceans of ignorance, we become increasingly aware of things that we didn't know, but there's still enormous amounts of things out there that we know nothing about, and uh, we're not sure at all. So there is the Black Sea of ignorance, and into this Black Sea, which we, which we know nothing, there is our small island of knowledge, the things that we know, and the red line around that is representing the boundary between the known and the unknown, the shoreline, the extent of our, of, our, of our awareness of what we're ignorant about, the things that we would like to find out question, uh, answers to, the things that we want to know more about. The, so that little red line is that tiny area. Now often, as if you would probably extend this metaphor further than it wants to go, if we, most of us occupy the centre of the island, the secure area of terrain which has been settled and known about for a long, long time, and we, and we potter around in the, in in the centre of the island. And, and there, some of us are more away, are, are, are fishing on the shores and exploring, maybe doing a bit of swimming, and, uh, but it's still... Um, as the, as you see, as the, as the island grows, as we find out more stuff, the area that we know we don't know about also grows. We realise that there are more increasing amount, number of things that we're not aware of. And uh, one uh, particular thing that I think maybe expressed this in a way which we can all appreciate is the former uh, US Secretary of State, Donald Rumsfeld, who, if you remember, uh, said these immortal words. Um, you probably, some of you probably remember that, that. And he came in his awkward and clunky locution, articulated this idea of known, knowns, unknown, known, and all this sort of thing. So I've, I've 
I've split this up. So these are the, these are the bits. So we've got the, the things that we know, the things that we know explicitly. And I think there's a, there's a danger with the things that we know because we feel we know them. That's where we look. We look for, it leads to um, a cognitive bias sometimes called survivor bias, which makes us look at the things that have survived and say, what, what, what does that contain? And not look at the things that haven't survived and miss important areas because we don't know what's there. And then there are things that we know we don't know. This is the shoreline of the island. These are things that we're aware. These are things which we've devised a research question for. These are things that we're excited about and think, you know, tomorrow's world used to make programs about flying cars. and this, These are the things that they thought would be the case. Then there are also maybe a category of knowledge where there are things that we just don't know that we know. We take for granted at a tacit or implicit level. We operate with this sort of stuff, but we've never actually put it into words or framed it properly in our thinking. It's things like, for instance, within a, within a school, you might know as a, as a piece of explicit knowledge that break ends at quarter past 11, but the tacit knowledge that you actually work with is that nobody actually turns up to lessons for another five minutes, you can have a bit more coffee. You know, that you don't necessarily articulate or know that you know that, but everyone acts as if this is, is known. And then there are the things that we genu genuinely don't know about yet. The areas of life and, and possibility which remain completely black to us. This is the sea, the ocean. What's out there? We, we're not sure. We can maybe make guesses and speculations, but we just don't know. So, um, I, uh, Tim, who's sitting here, it t again, sort of filled me in on an area of my ignorance and said that this is something that I've, I've unwittingly stolen from Rowan Atkinson and a comedy sketch that he did, but, uh, but I, I, I got it from a different source. Um, and, and I think this sort of describes the, 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 one of the problems that we have when we're, we're investigating problems. We're looking for a black cat in a dark room. We're looking for things... We're not sure what they are. We have glimpses, we have intuitions, uh, but it's particularly difficult if there's no actual cat in the room. The job becomes increasingly harder and, uh, and sometimes takes a long, long time to notice that the cat is absent. And, um, and sometimes, maybe, maybe there are areas now which we're looking into and there is no cat. And, and that's something I think we have to come to terms with and accept as a distinct possibility. So I wanted to say a few things to you about the idea of certainty, because what knowledge does is it makes us feel secure and certain and happy and satisfied and as if we have somewhere to go. And I think that the problem with certainty, one of them, you know, we've, we've already talked about this, that we don't know the things that we don't know, and we can probably accept that. But Maybe more interestingly is that when we say to someone, yes, that's right, that's the answer, that's, you, you've got the answer, I think what happens is that people stop thinking. When we know we don't know something, we continue thinking and investigating and being curious. But when we feel certain, we close down. And I've seen this happen in lessons that I've taught to children where... You know, I'll, I'll teach the lesson and I'll do my traffic lights and my, and my exit passes and they leave secure in that they've grasped a particular piece of information and they leave content in that knowledge and then they come back next week and they appear to have forgotten it. Have you ever experienced this? But what they remember is that they knew it. I, don't, I remember having this experience um, a couple of years ago. I'd watched a lecture by Professor Brian Cox, the physicist. It was fascinating, and I was really excited about it. And I said to a friend of mine, I saw this wonderful lecture by Professor... And they said, what was it about? And I said, oh, I don't know. But it was good. <laughs> and I think that happens quite a bit, that we, we remember f the feeling of knowing and the substance of what it was that we knew disintegrates. When we're uncertain that's not quite the same when we, when we continue thinking. So there are times, if I go back to thinking about my classroom practice, there are times when I've taught children and, and I've just botched it and I've pitched it too high and they're a bit confused and upset and, and I'm a bit ashamed of myself and they all troop out saying, bloody idiot. And, 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 and they come back sometimes and they've worked it out 
Have you ever had that happen? Is that just me? Okay. Oh, well, I don't think it happens necessarily all the time, but we've got quite a lot of language which describes this. We, we say that, you know, we, we sleep on it, we put it on the back burner, we chew it over, and, and we continue trying to integrate things that we're uncertain of into things that we already know, and that process means that we are more likely to stay open. I think one of the, the difficulties that we have with embracing an idea of uncertainty is that there's an evolutionary pressure on us to prefer certainty. Um, and so, if, uh, if we, you think, we think about the idea of you know, th this, I think if we think about politicians, we prefer them on the whole to be wrong than uncertain. We can't bear a politician or perhaps a school leader that says, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'll have, to, I'll have to have a bit of a think because I just don't really know about that. We, we can't bear that. And we punish people that say that. We prefer that someone was wrong and certain and confident. And then we relax and feel happier with that. And I think this evolutionary pressure is a preference for false positives. And if you can see in that sort of rather indistinct picture, you might be sort of calculating, is that a, is that a snake? Is it, is it just a bit of grass, or is it a snake? Now, on the savannah, when we, as a primitive person, evolution has rewarded people that decided it was a snake and acted accordingly. There's not much evolutionary advantage going, I'm going to pretend that's a bit of grass and then get bitten and die. So we, we've evolved to prefer certainty. It's difficult for us to live with uncertainty. We don't like it. We're challenged by it. And, and as soon as... As soon as we get information which we feel makes us confident and secure, we cling to it, I think. So, just to sort of open you up to, to the, the fact that you, you're wrong quite a lot and you're mistaken quite a lot and we can feel very secure about things, but we can expose ourselves to this idea that what we know is problematic. I'm going to show you a few... <coughs> Um, illusions, and this is quite a famous one, the Muller liar um, illusion, which probably many of you have seen before. And the, the, the idea here is that the, the line with the fins that are directed inwards appears to be shorter than the line with the fins that are projected outwards. But it's not too difficult for us to accept when I tell you that they're the same length. I think most of you would be, would be not too challenged to, to accept that that's probably true. Would they have, and that's easily provable and testable. And that's, but that's, that's, a, that's a common error in perception. I think there are, there are illusions like this which reveal more uncertainty and doubt. Um, and this is one of my favourites, Edward Addison's Checker Shadow Illusion. And um, if you've not seen this before, it's one of my favourites. And it's difficult. Nobody sees that A and B, the squares marked A and B, the dark square and the light square, marked A and B, with, the, with B being cast into shadow by the, the shadow of the, gr the green cylinder. Nobody can see that they are the exact same shade and colour of grey. We just can't see that. Our brains override what our eyes are telling us and present us with information which is contrary to our perception. We're seeing something which isn't there. We're seeing them as being different. But when I put this overlay onto the image, you can see perhaps more easily that they're the exact same shade and colour. And, it's, and all of us are wrong about this, predictably. We can't see that. We reinterpret what's there. And um, even though I knew this, somebody sent me this um, a, a while back, this illustration, and said it's operating on the same principle. The chessmen at the bottom are the exact same shade and colour as the chessmen at the top. And even though I I knew that that was probable from having seen things like that before. I had to cut the chess men out. I had to print out this thing, cut them out, stick them together before I would accept what I thought was probably going to be the case because it seemed so contrary to what I was seeing before me. And some of you might be feeling that. I've made the, the slides are available if you're interested on my blog. You can download them from there and you can print them out and you can cut out the chessmen. And, and maybe you should. Maybe you should do that. 
satisfy yourselves. And the other things that are difficult for us to see, we can see intuitively, or we believe intuitively, that the narrow table on this side would be far easier for us to carry through a narrow doorway than the slightly wider looking table on the other side. And we, we can see that quite strongly. Do you all, would you all agree that that appears to be the case? And I've tried to demonstrate how this might be wrong by showing that the yellow tabletop is the exact same dimension, but we can't see that. We're unable to see what's in front of us. The evidence of our own eyes and our senses is deceptive. Um, and this, these are, I, I like this little um, sequence of um, demonstrations from a Belgian a philosopher called Michot, and he was interested in the fact that we, not only do we see things that aren't there, but we see things that are there and then ascribe meaning to them, which is perhaps absent. And if I, sh if I run this for you, what's the purple ball, what's the relationship between the purple ball and the, and the orange ball? What's happening there? Yeah, it's pushing it. That's what people routinely say. It looks like that the orange ball is moving. Now, of course, it is. You know, in intellectually, it isn't. I've made an animation on a, on a PowerPoint. It took me quite a long time to make it do that. And when, when it's slower, when it's like this, we don't see that. We don't see that causality. We don't think that purple ball is pushing the orange ball because the frame has changed. But when the speed is just right, we feel, and the other thing, this one, what's happening here? What's the purple ball up to there? <laughs> when children are shown these sorts of things, they say that things like the, the orange ball is scared of the purple ball. The purple ball is chasing and bullying the orange ball. Or this one, where it looks perhaps like the purple ball is leading the orange ball. And we're programmed to see these sorts of things, to ascribe meaning to events, to overlay a sense of certainty on things which are unconnected and mysterious, but we're happier when we think there's meaning there. And you've probably heard people say this sort of thing to you in the past. Just checking that it's... If it looks like a duck and, and it sounds like a duck, it's probably a duck. And, and that might be true for quite a lot of the time, but occasionally it's not a duck. And, and this is Jar Stow's Duck Rabbit illusion, where, as you can, I'm sure, very quickly see, the, the ears of the rabbit become the beak of a duck. Now, what I find really, really interesting about this, it was an observation that I read about um, um, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein, the philosopher Wittgenstein, when he saw this, he said, the really interesting thing is that we can know there's a duck and know there's a rabbit, but we have to exercise a choice. We can't see them both at the same time. We, we select, are we going to see the duck or are we going to see the rabbit? And I think that maybe describes a lot of what we do in a complex field like education. We have arguments about things that we can see, and I'm interpreting that there's a duck and you're seeing a rabbit, but maybe we're both looking at the same time. The bit, for me, that Wittgenstein missed was there is no, there is no duck or rabbit. It's just a squiggle. And we're, we're creating the possibility of a duck or a rabbit. It is neither of those things. But we prefer to, we're comfortable with giving it that meaning. And that idea of the perceptual shift, if you've never seen the Necker cube before, what, this asks, what I'd ask you to do here is stare intently at that cube for about five seconds. Stare with all, you know, all of your, the intensity you can muster at the cube and, do you notice anything happening? Can you all see that? If, you, if, if nothing is happening, try blinking and then looking at it again. And what you should notice is that your perception shifts, that you're looking at it and the back wall of the cube suddenly becomes the front wall. And it's not something that you're consciously necessarily able to choose, it's unbidden. The, cho the, the choice happens, the perception shifts, and you can't, you can try and force it back, but it's difficult. And we see things, we, we, we have a certain amount of choice in the way we see things, but not completely. There are, there are elements where we don't necessarily get to choice. We can have epiphanies, we can suddenly see things differently sometimes, and realise that what we've been looking at isn't maybe what we thought. So, back to, back to foxes. 
and, and um, back to ancient Greece. And this idea of the, of the, uh, of the parable of Archaeolochus who talked about the fox knowing lots and lots of different little things, but a hedgehog knowing one big thing. So maybe uh, the hedgehog's trick, the thing it knows, is that it can protect itself from the fox by balling up and being a, 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 a spiky, un inedible animal. But the fox has lots of little cunning ways that it might perhaps have a go. But it doesn't have one overriding trick. And the um, literary critic, Isaiah Berlin, took this metaphor, writing an essay about Tolstoy, and, and he ascribed particular bits of meaning to the sorts of... He was talking about writers, and he talked about some writers and thinkers as being fox-like and others as being more having the characteristics of a hedgehog. And you can see some of the, 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 the thinking that he's describing there. And he's very clear in this essay to say that this is a, a patently false dichotomy. It's, uh, these extreme positions don't necessarily describe any one individual accurately, but perhaps we're on the continuum. And in, um, in The Signal and the Noise by Nate Silver, he talks about these types of thinking. And, and Nate Silver is suggesting in his book that foxes make much better predictors. They use knowledge and information much better because they're more uncertain. And these are some of the characteristics or the dichotomies that might describe some of the thinking and qualities of the fox and the hedgehog. And I was trying to fit myself um, into these categories. And I think that you know, I'm probably quite fox-like in certain respects. I, I'm not, you know, in terms of being multidisciplinary, I'll try anything once, um, except what was the, th except incest and Morris dancing, I think was the joke. But, um, I think I'm nothing if not adaptable. I, I'm cha I change my mind regularly. Uh, one of my favourite quotes from Marshall McLuhan is that I don't agree with everything that I say. Um, I'd like to believe of myself that I'm intensely self-critical and, and sceptical of my own ideas and, and, and tolerant of complexity. I'm not very cautious. Uh, I, I'm quite hedgehoggy when it comes to cautious. I'm a bit overconfident and too quick to, to uh, jump upon a bandwagon. I don't know if anyone remembers solo taxonomy. Um, and uh, ideological, empirical. I might be wrong, I kind of, you know, I'm torn between those extremes. And I think if you think about yourself and, and others that you know, maybe you can fit them into, into there as well. And so the insight here perhaps is that foxes know a little bit more about what they don't know. And just to sort of unpin that more, this, this is the description of a fox and this is a hedgehog. So a fox might and probably does have convictions about how the world should be, but is able to relinquish that better than a hedgehog who is perhaps more likely, has great, a greater tendency to see evidence as confirming biases. I, I think it's more interesting to try and explore rather than confirm what it is that we believe, but it's difficult to do so. It's really, really hard for us to maintain the uncertainty required to do so, but I think if we can, then we're at a distinct advantage. And on that subject, on, on, with that in mind, this quote here, I think, says, raises an important question for us when we're considering research and education, that if we're looking for an answer, if we're looking for proof, if we're looking to find out what works, we maybe expand the island of knowledge. Maybe we'll sit, have a longer shoreline for where we'll see different things. But really good investigation should be about trying to find new and interesting questions, not about answers. And that's difficult for us as, as teachers because we are looking to apply the fruits of research and have a degree of certainty in what we do when we teach children. And it's difficult for us to accept that there is no certainty, that there is always doubt, that we can't ever know that we're right. But I think that maintaining doubt, maintaining uncertainty, and accepting that we might be wrong means that we're less likely to be, if that makes sense. So, um, a quote there from education professor Lee Shulman, who's talking about the complexity of education, saying that how complex the job of a teacher interacting with a group of maybe 30 students is. It's an incredibly complex process. And so, 
just was one example about how we try and reduce the complexity. One of the ways in which we do that is in our hunt and our desire to identify good teachers. We have an intuition that some teachers are better than others. And we can look at statistics and we can see that, it, that statistically that's valid, that clearly there are teachers who appear to be better than others. But we're very, very bad at identifying who they might be on an individual case-by-case -case basis. And here are some of the things that we try and do to rectify that. We go and look at what teachers do, we observe them, we look at the results that their students get, we maybe we, we would ask the students themselves, and those are all things that we might try and do. Here are some, some problems, and this, this graph here illustrates how bad we are at using observation to identify teachers. If we wanted to do it with the degree of reliability that, the, high, the best degree of reliability, we would need to have four separate observations by four separate people in order to arrive at any kind, anything which is even approaching reliability. How often does that happen? When we look at outcomes, when we look at the results that students get, we see things that we think make us certain, but often we're, see we're seeing things that um, conceal important information. If you take over the class of somebody who did a brilliant job the year before, that's going to have some impact. If you take over the class of someone who did an appalling job the year before, that's going to have some impact. And if we were to try and um, reward or punish teachers based on student outcomes, the estimate is that we'd get that wrong. We'd, we'd end up perhaps punishing, perhaps sacking good teachers and rewarding or promoting bad teachers around about, you know, a lot, far more, uh, uh, more, far more than we could reasonably do. And 9% of those teachers who are rated as least effective with these kinds of measures, actually with other measures, might can come out as being seen as the most effective. 9% is a lot of individuals. And that's just the least effective. And I think this is a metaphor, it's quite useful. We can, we can weigh But it doesn't, we can weigh lots of people, doesn't tell us much about an individual. We can look at data and we can see that there's a, an issue, we can see that something's there, but it doesn't tell us much about an individual. We can just see averages, which might be useful for all sorts of things, but not for determining who's doing a good job and who isn't. There's just a few sort of points to make on that. And here's a, it, it, there's also there's a, similar problems with asking students what they think. And some of those, some of those problems are, well, are well known. So these are the sorts of surveys that, that might be used. You might um, be aware, I know that uh, Rob sitting at the side there is, is, has written and, and talks about using the, the tripod surveys and they have, they, they certainly are useful for various things, but there are, there are things which, we just don't know. There are things, there are lots of reasons to be uncertain. There's lots of reasons to be doubt. If we think we have accurate information on which we can then act, we might be wrong. We might cause us to do all sorts of things which turn out to be not in anyone's best interest. Um, I don't know if you've come across this um, story of Dr. Fox. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a bonus Fox reference. Um, and uh, Dr. Fox uh, was a, a fake academic who delivered a speech, I can't remember what it was, to a group of other academics on a subject and then asked, they asked how expert they felt this actor who was masquerading as Dr. Fox was and all of these people said how wonderful he was and then were quite upset when it was revealed that he was an actor and that they'd been gulled. We're not very good. We're not at, at quantifying and recognising these... The, we're... we're, we're, we're our, and our, our appreciation of things is changed by our pl pleasure in performance and how good we feel um, stops us seeing. And also it creates perverse incentives. It makes people act and behave in ways which they might not accept that they're trying to please an audience. So there are all sorts of reasons to be wary 
of, of those. And the message being that we can't reliably do this. With all the, the knowledge that we have, all of the masses of information at our fingertips, it doesn't tell us much other than that some teachers are better than others. That there are, so, there are better ways of doing things than others, but we can't, in all honesty, with any accuracy, say who those individuals are, I'd like to suggest. So we can just about tell the difference statistically, but not at the level of individuals. So, how do you make teachers get better if you can't sort of reward or punishment? What can you do about that? How are we doing for time, by the way? Does anyone know? Have I, how long have I got? Six. Six minutes. I think, rather than um, bang on for another six minutes and go into this next next bit, if you're interested, you can look at this stuff um, on my slides. But if I, if I pause it there, I'm just going to go over to the... So, um, the more we, we can acknowledge that we're uncertain, the more that we can admit that we don't know, that we're not sure, the more likely we are, I think, to make better decisions, certainly more tentative decisions, but better for that. Um, and, um, and I'd like you to try and bear in mind and remember that the times when you most feel that you're certain, the, thing, the things that you feel most secure and, and right about are the areas where might, that might repay you the most from being sceptical and reinvestigating and having another look at. And so that's what I wanted um, to talk to you about today. I hope um, that's at least made you, uh, well, that you found it uh, vaguely interesting. If you haven't, I can only apologise. Um, but if you've got any any questions you'd like to ask in the couple of minutes that we've got remaining, then uh, now's your chance. Hello. Thank you, David. That was uh, really interesting. And I really um, agree with your emphasis on uncertainty. Um, but just looking, I just want to I'll probably put a kind of a slight caveat on that. I think certainly in education, there is a lot that we do know through decades, if not centuries, of, of people scholarships and writers and teachers and educators that we're just ignoring, uh, uh, that's kind of being um, sort of swept aside in the search for new knowledge and certainly in the idea that the new knowledge will be more certain and lead to more predictable outcomes. For me that's, that's really problematic and I'm thinking now about as an English teacher and I'm looking at the Education Endowment Foundation's list of literacy projects. And this is where your, I think your point about questions really comes in. And their projects include things like texting parents, breakfasts, phonics, um, a whole range of, you know, so they've got something that's related to reading, writing, phonics, along with texting parents and breakfasts. And it seems to me that that's, that that's really problematic because those questions aren't, you know, the questions are great whether, you know, you, assuming that there's a, a relationship between what a child eats and how they're going to read and write, seems to me you need to really explain that and justify it. It's just presented as a self-evident fact. And meanwhile, you have the Literacy Association report saying a lot of primary teachers have a very limited knowledge of children's literature. So to me, the question would be better, the educational question would be better coming, you know, coming from the um, people looking at literature rather than a whole range of other people putting questions onto education that aren't really educational. Okay. Sorry, was that long winded? Did you get it? Was there a question in that? Um. <laughs> Right. Okay. And, and there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole. I, I'm fascinated by that. There's a whole field of study called agnotology, which is about looking at the unmaking and unmaking of knowledge, and looking how that we how we lose and conceal things that we knew. And um, and yeah, that's that's interesting. Maybe there are things that we ought to know that we did. People did know that have, are slipping and being lost. And, and and maybe we need people like yourself who are going to awkwardly and cussedly remind us of things um, when it's least convenient. And I think that's a, that's a positive. 
that we need people to cheerlead for the things that they are worried about. You know, being, people being awkward, are all, are all, are all, they're all, that's always good. I think we learn a lot from those. Is there anything else I can possibly help you with? Or would you, anything, please feel free to dismiss me as a fool and a charlatan. I, I won't be at all offended. Yes, hello. Hi. Um, yeah, I was really interested in what you had to say. Um, I've got kind of an opposite side to it, where you have the students who have a level of uncertainty. So, for example, I had a student who would always, very intelligent, always question you and always be like, there's, argue that black is white, pretty much. Yeah. He knew the answer, but That's, he wasn't moving I think the forward because he had this level of uncertainty about everything. Awkward bastards. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> yeah. But he had this level of uncertainty about every single thing that you were teaching him. So he couldn't move on to the next stage as quickly, even though he had the intellect to be able to do it. So it's about balancing that uncertainty with an actual definitive answer. And there is a way of you know, moving up and incorporating that research. Well, yes, and, and, and I think that um, I think someone like Martin Robinson is very interesting when, when, when he talks about his trivium. And you have to know, I think, and I, this is, this, I'm putting words in his mouth perhaps, that you have to know the grammar before you start questioning. That if you move into questioning and dialectic too quickly, then you never know anything. And so, yeah, shut up sometimes and listen because it's important for you to learn the, the questions and then you can critique them once we've all got this base. I think that might be fair sometimes. Yes, I wouldn't. I would. I would. I would think it would be a very bad base for a curriculum to say, "Let's <laughs> let's explore ignorance and and not be interested in knowledge." Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, this message isn't really for for ch children. It's for us. are going towards these are the facts that students know and it's, it's so damaging how do we as um, educators overcome that overcome the fact that um, we've been told by um, it's been set down in government policies that we need to there is a certain amount of facts that the students now need to know in the curriculum that's well what I, we're I don't think that's unreasonable I think that the more you know the more you don't the more you, you know that you don't know not knowing something isn't an advantage so, so Yeah, just always, I would, I would suggest, say, and now we can critique it now that we know. So, for instance, deciding, deciding not to teach Shakespeare just makes people ignorant of Shakespeare. It doesn't actually empower them in any way. But then, but teaching Shakespeare and saying, say, now let's, let's now say that this is the product of a dead white man and say, you know, all the reasons why it's not valid, that's much more interesting if you know something, I think. And we want, you know, we want, we want children who, can, who leave school and can, can, have, can take part in the discourse of wider society from a position of, of shared experience and knowledge, don't we? And then, and then of course, that's, um, well, thank you very much for your time and attention. If you want to, I've written a book which they're selling upstairs. It's, um, if you don't fancy reading it, it makes a great sort of kitchen stool for reaching those hard to reach upper cupboards because it's so thick. But uh, thank you very much. And, uh